Okay, so um, I posted a video about uh, about women in ministry, and I really looked at a lot of different things in that video. I looked at um, uh, where you get your value from, what your purpose is um, as a woman, you know, what defines attraction, you know, uh, um, attractiveness, uh, you know, whether women can be in ministry, all those kinds of things. And um, well, I. I didn't talk about purpose too much, and there's a reason for that. Um, I'm going to come back to that um, because a lot of times people think that there's some magical division between the purpose for a man and the purpose for a woman. But when you look at the creation story, um, that's just not really the case. And I'll look at that again in the future, but um, just kind of want to preface this with that. Um, and you might say, okay, well, so you were talking about women in ministry. What does being a man have anything to do with uh, being in ministry, and I would say that it is paramount. It is foundational to any man being in ministry. You know, a lot of times men try to lead according to what they think they're supposed to be like. They try to be harsh. They try to yell. They try to just uh, overpower everyone, and that's you know that's what it means to be a man, and that's what it means to lead. But I would argue that if we actually look at the Bible and start reteaching ourselves what it actually means to be a man, in finding our true biblical definition as a man, we would be able to uh, lead more effectively. Um, a lot of times why we don't do well in ministry or in any kind of leadership, whatever it is, is because um, of garbage that we kind of carry into the leadership position. Ask any pastor and they'll tell you, when I first start, took up this church, I thought I was going to change the world, and then I found out that the majority of what changed was me. I changed. And that's absolutely true. A pastor really has to change before he can ever influence an entire church. So let's redefine some things that I think had just gotten way out of hand, um, especially, you know, what I've seen in my in my years is the church went to this extreme of this is what it means to be a man. You know, you have to be real rugged. You have to be like – you have to like black is your color of choice, and, you know, you always have to talk real gruff, and you can't show any romance. And, you know, and then – so then now we're seeing men go to the other extreme, you know, where – you know, they're well. Well, I can, I can just kind of be whatever I want, and I kind of, I don't mean to make fun of that. I'm just like, there has to be some kind of a balance between these two extremes of being, um, uh, having no spine, and being a tyrant. There has to be some kind of uh, middle ground in that, especially as we start getting into new um, ground culture and culturally, we have a lot of issues that are coming up that really are not new issues. They've been around for a long time, but they've never been in the forefront like they are now. With that, we have, you know, the homosexual community. We have a transgender community, all kinds of stuff like that, that that's been there. I'm not trying to say anything against that, but we haven't really had to deal with it like we deal with it now. So let's look at what does it actually mean to be a man? Well, in Ephesians 5.25, one of the first things we see about being a man is self-sacrifice. You know, it told it told the woman, well, hey, you need to respect your respect your husband. You know, because men really need respect, and men tend to gravitate where they get respect from. But with that being said, what does your wife need more than anything else to feel like she has value, to feel loved, to feel like no matter what, you will always be there. And that's exactly what Ephesians 5.25 says. It says, husbands, love your wives. Now, this is a phenomenal thing because in the ancient world, it wasn't that big of a deal for Paul to say, wives, respect your husbands. Because that's the way that life structure worked. But then for Paul to say, hey, men, love your wives, wow, that was, that was really breaking the mold. Now, we think nowadays, well, of course you should love your wife. Because we come 2,000 years later, but at the time, what Paul was writing was really um, foundational uh, to the church. I mean, it was just mind blown. So we see a self-sacrifice. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, and he surrendered herself, himself for her. In that same way, love your wives. 
wow, we're talking about some serious self-sacrifice. Obviously, it should be at this point that you start to realize as a man does not mean calling all the shots in the house, having the final say on everything, um, doing whatever you want with finances and just expecting for your wife to have to go along with it, uh, not helping out around the house. Obviously, that has nothing to do with anything. And as I argued in the previous lesson, a wife submitting to her husband doesn't mean that he gets away with murder while he gets to hold a magnifying glass over her, because if a husband truly does love his wife and meets that foundational need in her to be loved, well, then he's not going to be making a bunch of tyrannical decisions, because it wouldn't be showing love to your wife to not include her in your decision-making. I mean, somehow along the line, men who wanted to take advantage of their wives found a biblical excuse to do that. Men who didn't want women competing for their ministry positions found a biblical way to get around it. Men who wanted to have the final say and not really be married found a biblical way around it. So, and I say biblical loosely, obviously. So Colossians 3.21 is, talks about a little, little bit different, but I, I think it still applies to the man as a whole. Um, it says that fathers shouldn't basically be overbearing. I, I, you can study that yourself, but basically the idea here is, is fathers don't exasperate your children. Don't don't be overbearing on them. Don't um, don't expect too much of them. Don't when you when you're disciplining them. Don't know when enough is enough. And I think that that kind of applies not just to fatherhood but to life in general. Men, for a long time, it seems like everybody thought that to be a man meant to be overbearing. But that's not really what we see. We don't see men as, as you have to go out and conquer the world. You have to go out and be stronger than everyone else. You have to go out and, you know, own everything else. And I think that's one of the problems with pornography is that it really um, speaks to a man's inner heart and passion and desire. He wants to be able to have things his way to completely dominate and conquer. That's just somewhere in a man's nature. So when you add something like pornography where you can have literally the perfect – sex fantasy i mean they they take some days to shoot it if they can't get the details right in that amount of time i mean it's just never going to happen you know and and they they do the men and the women up everybody looks perfect they all they're all you know in shape and just look great and then they sh they shoot this video and make sure there's no mistakes in it there's just something in us as men that that really appeals to um, so not overbearing. Galatians 5, 22 through 23, which I'm actually going to read um, from the New American Standard Bible. But, you know, it really contradicts everything that a lot of menly men teach, that this is God created you to be a man's man. Well, no, not really. Galatians 5, 22 through 23 says this, But the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence that the Holy Spirit is working in you as, as, a, as a new creation, is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, I'm, hold on, I lost my place, uh, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and here's the real kicker, all you men who think that storming off is going to be, that's what makes you a man, self-control. Again, since things there is no law. The evidence of God doing a work in you are these things. Well, if that's the evidence of God doing work, I don't think that God ever expected for you to have to be that big manly man. Now, if you are that man, that's fine. But don't expect everyone else to be just like you. A lot of times we, we think that there's this rigid line. Men don't sew. Women don't ride horses. Well, what if the line's not exactly like that. If you look in the Bible, the things that God told women not to do and told men not to do were more things that had to do generally for both of them. Like, for instance, hey, don't have sex with animals. Okay, that's not really something that applies to one sex over the other. That's something that applies. Okay, all right. You know, and we see a lot of little things like that where, where it's more stuff for both of them. The exceptions are something that is immoral for one to do that the other one can do. And if you look in the law, we really don't see too much of that. The majority of things that are wrong for one are wrong for the other. Off the top of my head, I can't think of anything that one can do that the other one can't do. Um, 
just off the top of my head, I can't think of anything. The Bible is more focused on morality, and morality isn't, it's not okay for one person, for a man to do something when it's not okay for a woman to do something. I mean, obviously, there's different situations, you know, but for the most part, the restrictions that God placed on men and women was more for both of them, not so much for one or the other. As one of the things, you know, that's just a side argument, so we'll get back to the main point here. In Proverbs, we see a big picture of what a man is supposed to look like. Um, he's supposed to be honest. That's like 50% of Proverbs is basically being honest. Not lying. When you're buying stuff, being honest. When you're selling stuff, being honest. When you're in court, being honest. Being an honest person. And then not being lazy. Um, if there's something that needs to get done, do it. Don't sit around and expect everybody else to do it. And then the, the, the next thing that is basically all of Proverbs summarized, be wise. Be smart with how you deal with people. Don't be hanging out with people who have short tempers and fuses. And don't be going around, you know, just handle yourself with wisdom. Think things through. Think before you talk. Men were never required to be that big, rugged John Wayne cowboy. Now, if they are, that if that's who they are, that's fine too. If they like, if a guy likes purple or pink, that's fine too. It's not like, oh, this color is restricted from your sex because why? I mean, obviously, I'm not saying that men should dress like women. I'm not saying that at all. But there's a difference between wearing a dress and liking a color. I mean, there's two very big differences there. What if? It's not a sin for women to wear jeans. Just roll with me on this. What if it's not a sin for women to wear a hat? What if it's not a sin for a man to wear a hat? Like, see, there's a lot of things in this that we've made issues of morality, but they're not issues of morality. They're issues of personal preference or culture or whatever. Basically, what a lot of Christians did is they said, in the 1950s, this is how people dressed. And so, therefore... This is how people should always dress. Like, for instance, pastors. Pastors are expected to wear suits and ties, even though at the earliest times, pastors dressed just like everybody else. Then eventually, as the church became imperialized, they had to wear special garments, which is stupid because that's the law that we've been freed from. And then throughout time, it eventually adapted into dressing your best, and then that became law where people had to dress in suits and ties. And then we got to how it is today where pastors are just kind of expected to dress like that. Not because there's any biblical reason, but just because that's the way they've always done it and they don't want to change things. Genesis 2.24 talks about how um, when uh, it says, For this reason a man should leave, leave his mother and father and... Be united with his wife, and they should become one flesh. So we're talking about working towards a common good. You know, being a part of a team. This is all. This is all something that that to me was groundbreaking when I first started studying this stuff. You know, men don't have to go out and do it alone. They don't have to fight all their battles alone. There's nothing wrong with leaning on the church for encouragement and strength. That's exactly what the Bible tells us to do. That's what Paul did. That's what Paul tells us to do. This is not something that, oh, women are weak, and so they must go to the church, but I am a man, and I can do it by myself. No man is an island. That's just plain stupid. Um, Genesis 127 um, talks about how God created, God created man in his image. Male and female, he created them in his image. We as men were made as us. We are uniquely us. And there's something fantastic about that. There's nothing that you have to do to prove that you're a man. There's nothing you have to do to be a man. There's nothing you have to do to... You're either born as a man or not born as a man. And it's that simple. And just because you don't fit the mold of what other people think that you should be as a man does not make you less of a man. There's just something very... about that. If you're anything like me, or like most men in America... Maybe your father just kind of expected you to be this this certain this certain thing. For for me, it was, a lot of it was sports. Um, I really sucked at sports. <laughs> I was great at music. Music just kind of clicked. Um, but I, I I my dad used to be a construction worker, and 
I hated construction. I was terrible at construction. It doesn't mean I'm lazy. It doesn't mean I'm uh, bad at, at, at other things. It just means that that was not me. My uh, One of my brothers is just, I mean, he really went crazy with construction. He was great at it and, you know, just like my dad. Um, real, you know, my dad's more of a, um, I don't want to say high strung person, but more of a, you know, da, 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 ah, I don't, can't think of the word, like things have to be a certain way. Perfectionist. Um, and I'm more of a kind of laid back person. So which of us is a man? Well, both of us. See what I mean? That's, that's kind of my point. I'm not criticizing my father and I'm not, you know, exalting myself here. My point here is very simply that God makes us special. That's it. The things that men are required to do are to dress like women. I mean, uh, r restricted from doing in the Bible. Men can't dress like women. Um, you know, the, the, that, that's a good example of something that a man can't do that a woman can do. A woman can dress like a woman. <laughs> you see what I mean? But then a lot of that depends on the culture. For instance, back in Paul's time, men wore things that looked very similar to dresses. We don't really wear that in America anymore. <laughs> uh, you see what I mean? And a lot of this has to do with us um, trying to make a law. Because people love to be in control of stuff. We love that. If we can just make a law to control things and to control issues and to make everything exactly like us, we don't have to grow, we don't have to learn, we don't have to expand. We just can just settle into our comfort zone. That's where we'd love to live. But the truth is, that's just not going to happen. If you aren't reaching new kinds of people in your church, people who don't think like you and don't act like you, then you really aren't being the church. Because the church was meant to go into all the nations and make disciples. Well, if we're going into the nations, we can guarantee that we're going to be running into different cultures. And I, I live in a Hispanic community. And a lot of times Hispanic um, families have a very strong uh, female um, there, or maybe a couple strong females. It, really depends on the family, but you get kind of what I'm saying. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of a culture clash there with the um, Caucasian communities who typically have a stronger male. Uh, so obviously, you, you get what I'm saying? You, you, I hope you see what I'm saying. Um, I'm not criticizing either. I'm just saying, so obviously, there's going to be a little bit of a culture clash there because, you know, the Caucasians are going to say, well, you need to have a man in charge, and the uh, Latins... The Hispanics are going to say, well, you need to have, you know, f f more, you know, whatever. You get what I'm saying. I don't really want to make this a big issue. You just kind of hopefully see what I'm saying. That they're, we're not trying to get people to conform to being American or to being from our culture. We're trying to get people to conform to the image of Christ. And you have to remember that the Bible is written in a context. And if you don't observe that context, you're really not going to be able to apply much to your life. Um, so then that takes us to, to the book of Song of Solomon, which shows us it's okay to be intimate. And a lot of times men, men feel like, well, I can't be intimate with my woman. Like on uh, King of the Hill, <laughs> there's this part where um, Hank goes to hold Peggy, hold, um, hold Peggy's hand in public, and somebody sends this old guy walks by, he says, Get a room, you two! And so Hank pull, pulls his hand out of Peggy's hand. <laughs> you know, it, it's a, that doesn't make you less of a man. Okay, being intimate, being um, soft, being a gentle soul, that doesn't make you less of a man. And I, I'm convinced that a lot of kids are having a hard time finding out who they are and finding out how they fit in the world just because there's no clear what makes me a man. And the answer is so much simpler than everybody makes it. You're a man because you were born a man. It's that simple. Well, I don't feel like a man. Well, that's okay. It doesn't make you less of a man. I mean, any more than if I think I'm a tree, I'm a tree. I was born a man, so I'm a man. I might not feel like the most manly of men, but that doesn't make me less of a man. And also we see in 1 Corinthians 14, 35 and 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 12, 12 that Paul expected, Paul expected husbands and fathers to be um, a spiritual example for the household and to, and to raise their family up into... Um, Christian growth and discipleship. As the head of the house, what that entails is not lording it over people. What that entails is being responsible for teaching and training your family. If you as a husband and father are not going to church, are not making church a focus, 
the, your kids never see you reading the Bible and praying and seeking after God, don't be surprised when they don't think that God's that big of a deal. Don't be surprised when they go off and do their own thing and they go off and you know sleep around and they get up. Why would they follow an example that's such a poor example? See, but as Paul shows us, it's the husband, it's the husband and father's job to make sure that his family is growing in Christ. And so misunderstandings about men. First off, being a man's man isn't the goal. I think that that's been pretty obvious by what I've looked, shown at in the Bible and just by from what I've said. Um, hobbies don't make you a man. If you don't go hunting, that's okay. You don't have to hunt to be a man. The, uh, little things like that. Sewing doesn't make you less of a man. It, I mean, sewing is actually a very uh, good skill to have, and actually a lot of cowboys had this skill. So, I mean, there's that. Um, cleaning the house doesn't make you a woman. That means that you are contributing to your house's well-being. When you help your wife, you are actually helping yourself because your wife is part of you, which is part of your household. The two shall become one flesh. So it's not like you're doing your wife a big favor. It's like you're doing yourself a big favor. Um, and also, just a little side note, your wife will probably, probably be more willing to be intimate if you do stuff around the house. Just saying, throwing that out there, you know. Um, also, you know, um, sometimes men have, you know, like erectile problems and stuff. Having a fully functional penis is not what makes you a man either. So then obviously the question becomes, what if I was born with, you know, maybe not a fully developed uh, part? And I will get to that in just a minute. Um, you don't have to get married. Uh, in Matthew... Um, well, in Matthew and 1 Corinthians, Paul and Jesus both talk about this. You don't have to get married. Um, if you have homosexual temptations, that doesn't that doesn't make you any less of a man. That means you're tempted to sin. Just like if you're a straight man and you're tempted to sleep around, you're tempted to sin. I mean, it's, it, this isn't rocket science. People have made things too complicated. You know, for instance, only a small portion of the American society is actually homosexual. And yet, what are Christians most known for being against? Not gossip, not complaining, homosexuality. When such a small portion of the community actually practices this sin, that's all the Christians can focus on. And so what happens when somebody comes in and is sleeping around? Well, we show them love and, okay. What happens when there's a rich person that comes in? Oh, well, we show them love. What happens when there's a homosexual that comes in? The boy ain't right. You know, see what I mean? Like, it's it's suddenly a line in the sand where all of a sudden, this is the person I cannot love. So what we do is we don't, Paul says to, to bring correction to the church while looking to yourself. So what we do is we say, well, I'm better than them. Instead of looking to ourselves, we are excluding ourselves. I can gossip. That's okay. At least I'm not a homosexual. Meanwhile, the homosexual is saying, well, hey, it's okay that I'm a homosexual. At least I'm not like this person. So everybody keeps handing off their sin to someone else. We each have to take responsibility for our own sin. Um, also, sexual confusion doesn't make you less of a man. Just because you don't feel like a man, just because you know maybe you're confused about who you are, none of this makes you less of a man. Um, I would say you should probably refrain from any serious decisions like sex changes or something if you're in a time of confusion. Um, that probably just should be something that you do. You should probably hold off on any major decisions when you're going through a time of, of uncertainty, be it depression or anything. Um, okay. Um, men, at, when they were first created, they weren't created with a truck and they weren't created hunting. In fact, Early man didn't even eat meat. If you look at the Bible, people didn't eat meat at first. And so obviously they didn't hunt. What was Adam's pastime? Naming animals and gardening. Yep. In fact, the Bible doesn't even mention anything about sex until after they were already out of the Garden of Eden. So we know that being a sex monster isn't really what makes a man a man either. Just throwing that out there. If if having sex was inherently something that made us a man, I think that that God probably would have put a little more emphasis on it. So Matthew nine nineteen eight through twelve, and you know whether single or married, it is important that men are faithful. 
faithful to work, faithful to family. The world needs faithful men. Um, so in Matthew 19, uh, verses 8 through 12, what's happening here is people are, men are just kind of getting married and having divorces. When the Jewish women really had no say in it. Um, the men just kind of had the final say, and, and, and uh, it was an unfortunate um, sexism that developed because men wanted it to be like that, and so they used the law to confirm what they already believed. So now, now we get to this. He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. See, God expected us to be able to face challenges, to be able to work through them, to grow from them, and to keep, keep, keep moving on. But somewhere along the line, we said, ah, I give up. I'm not really wanting to work. I'm not really wanting to do this anymore. And we've told women, my love for you is very much conditional. I don't want to actually marry you because I don't want to commit, but I'm willing to have sex with you. Uh, I'm not willing to stay married to you because we had an argument or a series of arguments or a disagreement for years. Instead of working things out and being there, I have decided to just kind of cast you aside. Oh, I see that you are sick and dying. Well, I guess I'll just go ahead and push you to the side because my love only extended to your good health. See, that's that's not something that oh, be a man. Men don't men men should be faithful. Women should be faithful too. God has created us to be faithful to people, um, and we're only as good as our word. And if we're really not keeping our word, well, then who are we? Verse 9 says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman and commits adultery. So what, what he's talking about is how men were, were divorcing and going to another woman, divorcing and going to another woman. And Jesus says, hey, you're committing adultery. Now this isn't to say that men, you can never be remarried after divorcing. He's talking about a very specific situation. And in Mark, when it talks about this, it says, or if a woman divorces a man, um, she she and marries another she's an adulterer so it it does go both ways it's just that you know so anyways basically don't get divorced for the sake of getting married to someone else um and divorce you know is a very serious thing and you know the thing about divorce is it it ensures that nothing good can come from the situation it it's not divorce isn't a good option there's two options that divorce makes is the lesser of two evils divorce is where you say we're just breaking off that, you know, it's it's going to cause less harm divorcing than staying married. Can you honestly say that? If you're thinking about divorcing your wife and you're thinking about just throwing her away like a used towel, consider that. It should only divorce should only be considered if it if it is the healthier of the option or the other option. Um, you know, uh, harm is going to come from the situation. Divorce isn't a good option in and of itself. It's the better of two evils when the situation calls for it. Now, obviously, um, if you've ever been a pastor or any kind of social worker, you know that the majority of people think that they have a good reason for throwing people away, but um, very few actually do. And everybody thinks that they're the exception to the rule. So let's look at this. The disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. So if I can't just throw my wife away, it's better to not be married. Let's stop and think about that. Yeah, it really is that stupid. So this is Jesus' response. He just kind of glosses over that that clear, obvious stupidity because it's like, well, I just said that um, it wasn't meant to be like that from the beginning. You obviously didn't hear what I said. So instead of belaboring the point, he kind of moves on a little bit. Not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. In other words, not all men should be married. <laughs> And then he goes in verse 12, For there are eunuchs who were born that way that way from their mother's womb. This is people who are uh, born improperly formed, uh, men or women. Um, and there are eunuchs who are made eunuchs by men. These are people who either mutilated themselves or were mutilated by someone. Um, back in the day, it w more had to do with um, court officials, you know, making them a eunuch so they couldn't sleep with the queen or something. Uh, but, I mean, it still applies to a man who cuts on himself. Um and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. That is, um, remained, remained spiritual, uh, sexually um, uh, clean? I don't know what the word there that I'm looking for is. Um, refrain from sexual activity. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. See, it's easy 
to resolve someone else's conflict if you don't suffer the same thing. Let's say I'm a healthy physical male. I, you know, my my count, my my testosterone count is normal. My my penis is formed correctly. It's e it would be easy for me to say, hey, you men who don't who haven't formed correctly, you need to just know who you are and not suffer with your identity. But now let's switch the tables and say I haven't formed correctly. Well, now it's going to be a little bit easier for me to sympathize. Which brings me back to the thing about what if your parts weren't formed correctly. For that, let me just encourage you with this. If you aren't happy, having a relationship with someone doesn't change that. Some people are temporarily distracted by their relationship because they think it's kind of like getting a puppy. And then when the reality of the relationship hits, well, they're not happy anymore and they want to sleep around and they want to look at pornography. So with that being said, you are a value regardless of whether your body works correctly. If you have had a sex change, God still loves you. And God can still use you. Absolutely. Now, there is a little bit of overlap here because if you are a man who has, you know, cut his penis so as to physically appear to be a woman, um, that needs to be something that you spend time in prayer. And I would highly um, discourage um, those kinds of people from partaking in ministry just because to be in ministry you really have to have a firm um, self of uh, idea of who you are and who God is and if you're struggling with that it might not be best to be in leadership because like James says leaders are judged harsher and we really are held up to a higher standard and so if you're just going to cause somebody just confusion probably not a great idea for you to be in leadership um, if it's something that can be reversed, you know, and you realize that maybe you took actions based solely on um, a temporary feeling or something like that, whereas sometimes people are improperly formed, and so you try to get corrective surgeries to correct the error, and for that, I would I would encourage you not to do that just because there's no reason. I mean. Unless it's causing you physical pain, I mean, to have a birth defect is just that. It's a birth defect. When we get to heaven, our bodies aren't going to matter. They're just not going to matter. We're going to be given a, a glorified body. So I hope that that kind of brings some clarity to some things. And just remember, if you're a teenager, it's totally normal to feel inadequate and to try and overcompensate and to feel like you have to do something to be a man. But none of those things are actually biblical. Um, I know it's hard to just accept that. I know most people have to kind of just struggle with it themselves. But remember, remember that any struggle you go through is a temporary thing. So, okay. I hope that that brings you a little bit of relief, that you don't have to measure up to some...